Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Ken and others for inviting me here. It's an excellent conference, and I'm pleased to be able to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about wild oak control, but it'll apply to other, uh, other weeds as well, obviously. And so um, my overview is, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the herbicide resistance situation, because obviously that's uh, why a lot of people are interested in, in weed management right now, because of the herbicide resistance situation. I'll then talk a little bit about wild oat management and split it up into some of the individual practices that are important and then combining those practices. And lastly, talk about a new uh, method of uh, weed control, harvest weed seed control that was developed in Australia and perhaps some of the potential that we have for that to uh, be effective here. So first of all, on a resistance, we shouldn't be surprised when it, uh, when it occurs because anything we do in a biological system where there's variability and we repeat it over and over again, we select for resistance. So when we're in, a, in an automobile plant where there is no variation, it's just steel and rubber, uh, we don't get resistance because there's no variability. But in, a, in biological and living systems, we select for variability where that's antibiotics, fungicides, herbicides or anything else we do over and over. And this is one of the more dramatic examples where on the left you have a rice plant and the right a barnyard grass plant. And after 200 years of hand weeding, uh, you select for a barnyard grass plant that looks like rice. And that's what, it, what you have in the middle there. And so it resists even hand weeding. So that applies to tillage and other things. So we shouldn't be surprised that we get those types of things. In the insect world, we see the similar types of selection can lead to dramatically uh, changed uh, insects. So uh, I like showing herbicide ads. Hope I don't offend too many. Um, this is an, an older one. But it suggests that uh, these herbicide tools are absolutely incredible. You can pretty well destroy weeds with any one of them if you flip the right switch and uh, you pick the right herbicide. And so uh, with that type of mentality, we, we have the idea that herbicides are the solution. And uh, here's the increase in herbicide resistant weeds. Uh, we uh, are not, there's no real indication there that those, uh, those resistant weeds are going to decrease anytime soon. Um, probably they may start decreasing on the graph because people will get tired of reporting them because everybody's just aware that they're around. We do not want to get to the situation that they are in uh, Western Australia. This is the wheat belt, 15 million acre annual survey. This is a random survey. So these plants weren't picked out because they were resistant. They're picked out because they were there. And uh, in that survey, you can see that almost every single population has multiple herbicide resistant, meaning it's resistant to at least two modes of action. And there are rigid ryegrass plants in Australia that resist seven <laughs> modes of action in one plant. And altogether, rigid ryegrass resists 11 different herbicide modes of action, and there are only 20 known major herbicide modes of action. And so they're at a much different situation than we are, and they've developed uh, uh, other strategies other than herbicides because they're desperate. And so we'll talk about that later. The U.S. situation isn't a lot better. Um, this is a map from Jason Norsworthy, University of Arkansas, showing millions of acres with a glyphosate-resistant weed species. So it went from, in just two years, from 33 million acres with the species to 61 million acres, uh, meaning that almost half of all U.S. farms have a glyphosate-resistant weed. Surveyed farms, not all U.S. farms, the farms in the survey. And this was rather alarming. I just uh, saw this in the scientific literature from weed research, suggesting that uh, goosegrass or leucine indica, which is a, a tropical grass in rice, is now resistant, a single plant, to glufosinate or Liberty, glyphosate or Roundup, Paraquat, and ACCA's inhibitors. These are group one uh, herbicides. So uh, they're losing their options because they've overused herbicides. In Canada, uh, we have uh, glyphosate resistant kochia in the west in the prairie provinces. And we've added a, a fourth glyphosate resistant species in Ontario, the, the water hemp, and had a few there. And it's no secret as to why these things are happening. We don't really need to look at this in, in great detail, like our, these uh, early scientists. Um, we can look at uh, Roundup Ready market share in soybeans, where we're uh, 
pretty close to 80%, probably over 80 now. Martin likes that slide. Um, so <laughs> this made me laugh. So, uh, and here's uh, Ontario Roundup Ready Corn, where the market share is, is even higher than that. So we put incredible selection pressure on these weeds to get resistance, and it's not surprising we have it. This is, uh, to me, this is an interesting slide. This shows the, the number of weeds resistant to specific herbicides. So you can look at the one at the top there, and that's uh, triazine, or atrazine, a triazine herbicide. And it has the most, it's been around the longest. So if you consider three things, which, one, which herbicides are most susceptible to resistance, which ones have been around the longest, and then perhaps which ones have the most wide use, you can account for everything here. So the high-risk herbicides, the ones that are most susceptible to developing risk resistance, group one and twos, they account for most of the herbicides there. The ones that have been around for a long time, Paraquat, Simazine, Atrazine, they account for the others. And then there's glyphosate, which is a very high area of use, or Roundup. But this uh, graph was taken in September of last year. Uh, I updated this uh, graph, and uh, it's interesting how things change. So now, now we're looking uh, pretty close to where it is right now, but um, look at where uh, glyphosate is. It was uh, just a year ago, it was at 24 species, and now it's up to 31. So it's, one of, it's the most rapidly increasing uh, herbicide with resistant species developing resistance to it. So I want to go back to wild oat a little bit because that's uh, what I was supposed to be talking about. And uh, wild oat uh, is, what in Alberta, it's our most resistant species in terms of herbicide resistance. So if you look at uh, the resistance maps, these are provided by Hugh Becky. Um, the open circles show resistant sites and the, the, the black circles not resistant. And uh, see how rapidly that's changed in a matter of very few years. So early 2000s, 11% of the fields in a random survey, and now we're over 50% of our fields. So this, again, is not looking for patches and saying it's resistant. This is going to random sites. And what is the reason for that? It's because we apply so many wild oat herbicides. It's the number one herbicide in terms of dollars per acre spent and in terms of uh, uh, the amount of herbicides that it's applied. So we apply more herbicide, we have lots of wild oat, we get lots of resistance. This is uh, an older herbicide that you old timers will remember, I do, I'm old enough. And uh, do any of you remember having resistance to that herbicide? There was none. Why? Well, it wasn't effective enough. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't select enough of the susceptibles. But maybe we shouldn't uh, think too strongly about having the most, we, we don't really need 99% control to save and protect yield. And uh, that herbicide did pretty well at protecting yield. And it let a few susceptibles through, and so we didn't select so fast. So perhaps we shouldn't uh, pay attention to the herbicide ads that suggest we need a new clean field to uh, protect our yields. So individual practices, and this uh, graphic uh, suggests that when you, when you combine individual practices that you can create something bigger than just the one. This isn't an obvious wild oat management uh, or resistance management picture, but on the left you have a canola hybrid planted at one centimeter, on the right at four. And just the differences in emergence can necessitate a herbicide application that's not necessary on the left, but is necessary on the right. So a second herbicide application uh, is needed, or, or maybe, and uh, that applies unnecessary selection pressure for resistance. So just seeding depth can uh, be an important practice. Here's a fertilizer placement, and this is a little bit uh, aggressive to go to 90 kgs of N in the seed, but you can see what hap with the seed, and that, that's what happens in barley. Even at 30 in dry years, you can reduce the stand. But on, so you get 22% green in green canopy, and on the right where you've uh, place that nitrogen in the sideband, 78% green. Much more competitive stand. And then if you go six weeks later, from, the, from early June to late July, or mid-June to late July, you can see what that, that crop looks like. And in fact, when we did wild oat biomass in that crop, we had five times as much wild oat biomass 
where we had placed too much nitrogen with the seed. That's another practice that we need to avoid if we're interested in wild oat and other weed management. Uh, gentleman at my table was talking about silaging and how good that is for uh, weed management. We've done some work on that and showed some fairly dramatic results. So there were three treatments, uh, basically, that we're interested in here. Uh, one of them was barley grain in blue, early cut barley silage, meaning a little, week, er, a little more than a week earlier than normal, and then normal cut silage, and then in combination with some herbicides. So here's the treatments uh, without any herbicides, and you can see in grain production without herbicides, the black line, that wild oats just generally increase, which we'd expect. Normal cut silage, they also slowly increase, but a little, just cutting a little more than a week early can uh, keep wild oat uh, management at a pretty good level. In fact, when we compare that red line, which is early cut silage with no herbicides, to grain production with full rates of Achieve and Amazomethabenz or Assert, this is chalcoxidum, uh, we do as well or better with no herbicides than with full herbicide rates by cutting the silage just a week early. So crop rotation is obviously another thing that we, uh, uh, we uh, advocate for weed management. I'm going to go through why that works. Uh, I've shown a, a January to December crop uh, year, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to show what wild oats are generally adapted to. We generally, on the prairies in the last 40 or 50 years, have selected for summer annual weeds because we grow predominantly summer annual crops. Back before herbicides were readily available, we grew more winter annuals, we grew more uh, alfalfa and other perennials. And so now we've, we've adapted wild oats so that it grows very well in a very easy summer annual crop system. It's very easy for wild oats to adapt. The organic growers and, and others uh, before herbicides called the stale seedbed technique. They just delay the crop, uh, plant it a little later, the green wedge there, and then they let the wild oats come up and kill them down. And that can be effective. Uh, there are those that will plant a little earlier than wild oats are adapted to, and that also gets the crop ahead of the wild oats so it doesn't cause so much yield loss. Uh, and typically in winter annual crops, winter wheat, winter triticale, fall rye, uh, planted in the fall, they're so far ahead of the wild oat when they come up in the when the wild oat comes up in the spring that you don't need a wild oat herbicide. And so you can totally reduce any selection pressure for wild oat resistance in that year when you grow winter annual crops. But you say, well, so I'll grow winter annual crops over and over again. And so then once you do something over and over again, something else comes in. And this is Bob Blackshaw's data from Lethbridge showing when you grow winter wheat over and over again in red, uh, the winter annual weed, downy brome, which has the same life cycle, uh, increases dramatically. And you can reduce that by doing anything else, going to fallow or going to a summer annual crop like canola. So I'll show some uh, integrated uh, weed management uh, data now. Um, but before I do, I'll show the perennial forage data because this is one of the best ways to get at wild oats and many other weeds. And that is um, when you cut these, uh, these crops during the growing season, the, the weeds have little chance to produce viable seed. And so any, any seeds that may have been resistant uh, really don't go into the seed bank. So that's one of our better methods. Um, integrated weed management, uh, one of the first studies we did, uh, we thought it was good at the time, but we found out later we could do better. But I'll show you the results from that. We had three main treatments here. One was rotation, one was uh, varieties, and we tried to plant a one competitive variety versus a less competitive variety, and seeding rate where we planted normal seeding rate and double seeding rate. And we'll look at some data from year five for, uh, for this study. And here's some pictures first from year five showing that uh, when you had very little good agronomic management and you tried to get away with a very low herbicide rate five years in a row that the wild oats took over. So we had continuous barley, we had uh, uncompetitive and low seeding rate situation. And here's the same herbicide regime five years in a row, no difference in herbicides, but the plot is essentially clean uh, and we haven't changed anything herbicidal. We've just doubled the seeding rate and we've gone to a, a rotation with canola and peas in it and, uh, and um, used taller, more competitive varieties in this case. 
So um, that's, in some ways, that's uh, pretty interesting because it's uh, pretty dramatic. If we look at it from the actual data point of view in terms of wild oat biomass reduction, there's some synergies that can develop as you, d you uh, add one practice to another. So on the top line there, you see that when you double the seeding rate, you can reduce wild oat biomass by almost threefold. You go to a short to tall variety, twofold, and similar with rotation. And then you put two of those practices together and you can reduce wild oat biomass six to eightfold. And when you add all three together, it's 19-fold <coughs> reduction in wild oat biomass with no change in what you do with herbicides. Um, one of the things that uh, was important in that study was that we, uh, we didn't really do a very good variety rotation of the barley cultivars. Kelly Turkington showed that um, here's, CB, here's CB barley, which was preceded uh, three years previously by CB barley, all three years. Here's CB barley, which was preceded by, not by different, uh, not by different broadleaf crops, but by different barley varieties, an oat crop and a triticale crop. Same CB barley planted side by side. So that has some crop health advantages, so that if you are in a stuck in barley silage, like we, some people are in Lacombe area, um, year after year you can at least rotate varieties and be more competitive with weeds. So what's better than a canola barley pea rotation? Um, well, obviously, if you're after wild oats, you've got to change up the life cycle a bit. So we didn't do that in that study. So in the, the second time we, we started this a new study, we actually put in some more diverse rotation, including some winter cereals and some, uh, some uh, alfalfa as a, a true perennial. And we did this at eight sites to get a good look at it, and we're just in our final year now and getting some pretty good data from the study. Uh, we'll look at wild oat biomass. We're still looking, we'll still collect, we're not collecting, but we're still determining the wild oat seed bank. Uh, and so we'll have that data later, but we'll look at wild oat biomass just at one site, uh, but it's uh, fairly similar across sites. First of all, here's some of the checks, and uh, the most important check in here is what's being done predominantly on the prairies. Canola wheat, canola wheat, 100% herbicide rates. Here's a chem fallow treatment, 2x seeding rate of fall rye in between, and here's alfalfa. So these are what we consider to be our checks, or what do we want to compare some of our treatments to. We also had some typical summer annual treatments, and you can see uh, with the H behind it how much herbicide was applied. So in peas or canola in 2012, in red, we used 100% rates. The more interesting treatments to me, though, were these uh, five or six, five treatments where we had no wild oat herbicide three years running. And the question is whether some of these treatments can, uh, can do as well as canola wheat with a full herbicide rate. So we're looking here at something like a 2x seeding rate of early cut silage, 2x seeding rate of winter wheat, and a 2x seeding rate of winter triticale. And you'll see how some of those treatments did. Obviously, when we cut uh, silage early enough, we can do well with uh, reducing the viable wild oats. So that was an important treatment in this study. And alfalfa also gave us the opportunity to reduce uh, viable wild oat seeds. Here's a, a plot that in this year, so this is 2013, that was a 2x seeding rate of winter wheat. And you notice we didn't do any normal seeding rates because integrated weed management requires you to step up your game a little bit. It's not that expensive to up your game in cereals when you're doubling your seeding rate. A different story in canola and some other crops, peas. But in cereals, it's pretty easy and cheap. So um, 2013, uh, the the Treatments before that in 2011, it was early cut silage and also early cut silage in 2012. And this treatment has quite a few wild oats getting through it. And what really happened is doing the same thing over and over again, two years of early cut silage, we had one year where we had a very open fall and that early cut wild oat actually developed viable seed. It was cut off early in August. We had an open fall all the way through September and we got a lot of viable seed produced. So Early cut silage isn't the answer either, all the time. Here's a similar plot, uh, 2x seeding rate of winter triticale, again without herbicide, three years running. First year was early cut silage, second year was 2x seeding rate of winter wheat, and almost complete control of the wild oats. 
So we'll just look at one slide. They're fairly complicated data slides and the, it shows the four years of the treatments. And on the bottom, you've got the canola wheat, canola wheat rotation with 100%. So that's the treatment we're wanting to uh, see if we can do as well as. And here's the data. Any of the blue bars are bars that are significantly greater than the, the bottom canola wheat rotation. And you can see that there are several treatments without any wild oat herbicides three years running that I've uh, circled in orange or yellow there that have done as well as this treatment down here. So you've got uh, early silage, winter wheat, uh, winter triticale, all at double seeding rates doing well. This does well, this does well. Alfalfa does the best. And so it is possible to do pretty well on wild oats even without using herbicides. And many people say, well, that's great, but I don't want to grow any of those crops. I can tell you that um, um, in, a, in uh, Arkansas and Georgia and several of the southern states where they have palmer-resistant uh, palmer uh, amaranth, um, that they're growing something other than cotton now. And they don't want to grow something other than cotton, but they are. And they're also plowing where they didn't want to plow. So until we're able to say, uh, I'm willing to make a bit of a sacrifice to change something, to do something a little different, we're not gonna change weed resistance. If we say, well, I, I'm not willing to grow anything other than canola wheat, well, you're gonna have more resistance. So that's just tough. Um, the, Danuk here is showing off a new Swiss Army rock, so I'm gonna show a new harvest management uh, technique here. And that's uh, the one that they've developed in Australia. The Harrington Weed Seed Destructor is basically a coal mine type piece of equipment where you, uh, it grinds up coal and so it works well. So you put it on the back of a combine, collect the chaff. Most of the weed seeds are in the chaff and uh, you grind them up and so they're not viable anymore. And you spread out the residue so you're not really taking residue off. So it works very well in Australia for the reason that the two weeds they're most interested in are held very tightly through harvest. If the weed seed drops before it can go get into the combine, well then it's not going to work. So they do not only weed seed destruction, they bale chaff and they collect, uh, they collect chaff too. That chaff collector was invented in, in Canada, by the way, and they've adapted it. So how well does harvest weed seed control work, or what is the potential? We're just starting to uh, new studies on that. We've uh, started a study in Western Canada. We'll have a Harrington seed destructor here next year, next harvest, but we're doing studies prior to that to see which weeds are most likely to be influenced by it. So here's three weeds, uh, wild oat, cleavers, and canola. And we're looking at weed seed retention because it's only the weeds that are, uh, that are retained on the plant and can get into the combine that will work well. And I'll show three different timings here. The first timing is, uh, this is swath timing for wheat in our area. This is uh, the normal straight cut timing for wheat and here, and whoops, the last one, uh, that was a big whoops, but the last one was um, when our faba beans were harvested. So you can see with canola in blue, there's a lot of potential to, because those seeds are held very well with cleavers. Uh, especially early, we can get almost, we can get most of the cleaver seed. And uh, when we wait till, um, even when we wait till wheat straight cut time, well, we've still got about 80% of cleavers. But for wild oats, uh, for whatever reason, our wild oats are different than what they are in Australia because we're only getting about 20% of the seeds retained. Whereas in Australia, they get well over 50. And it may be that they're growing their crops over the winter and going into a dr very dry season or something, but they get more than we do. So there is potential and we should be looking at that potential. So now we can go to Omar and the gang here. Um, and you can guess that these guys are having trouble getting anywhere. And uh, so I've added, I've added um, my comment here. There's the herbicide sales team and the IWM team. And you can guess what you think, I think they are. <laughs> so in summary, uh, weed resistance is, uh, is uh, continuing to increase at a very rapid pace. Um, Combining single and non-herbicidal practices will be what we need to do for effective wild oat management and for effective weed management going forward. It doesn't mean that we have to stop using herbicides. We just have to try to use them a little less often to reduce our selection pressure. So we're not in the same place as they are in Australia. 
And uh, we need to look at harvest weed seed control and uh, we're getting data from other sites in and it looks like there are quite a few weeds that will do pretty well with harvest weed seed control, but some will not. So with that, I think uh, perhaps there's, I'll thank the guys that do the work and the sponsors uh, of our projects. And is there time for questions? Yes. Yes, a couple minutes. Are there any questions? I have one that came from Twitter. Um, Jay Schultz said that at uh, Canola Council meet or Canola Producers meeting, you said that only 20% of uh, most land throughout the province is sprayed with a pre-seed burn-off. How does that affect herbicide resistance? Um, I don't remember saying that, but maybe somebody did. But um, so, are you saying that if we have uh, that's not much, or that's if we too have much? More pre-seed burn-off. Well, herbicide. I'm thinking in, in cereals, if we don't do a pre-seed burn-off and we just rely on our group one to take care of wild oats. Okay. So it's a good question because it depends on what's up at the time. And generally in pre-seed, uh, some of our, not a lot, a big population of our, many of our resistant weeds are up. And so you're not putting a lot of selection pressure on for pre-seed. So it's not fair to say that a pre-seed treatment has the same impact on resistance that an in-crop herbicide does where most of the weeds are there. So yeah, if you had more and more pre-seed, it's going to add selection pressure, but it won't add as much as, as uh, an in-crop herbicide application. Other questions? Yeah, I, you know, we've gone away from them for several reasons, uh, uh, but I like bringing some of them back. Um, we like the herbicides that give us 95% control, but those are the very herbicides that lead resistance the fastest. So you go back to Treflan and Edge, Avidex, some of those herbicides that didn't work quite as well. They still, there's still a lot of uh, susceptible uh, weeds out there to those herbicides and I, I like the idea of, of bringing them those back. I don't know that uh, carbine will come back, <laughs> but um, maybe Avenge will uh, and uh, Avidex, Triolate Edge, all those. Uh, I, I like the idea of bringing them back because we can take some pressure off some of our other herbicides. So the more diversity in herbicides you can use, the better. Um, but um, I'd prefer to use a lot more non-herbicidal practices, but uh, that also works. Okay, right. thank, thank you. you.